Welcome, everybody, to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Inc. I'm Pete Wright. That there is at Howard Tybal on Twitter. Look at you. Huh? You look at you. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's great doing it like this. So Pete and I can actually watch each other while we're doing this. I know. I feel like this Fantastic. is what the, this is this is kind of how the NSA lives. <laughs> are you that, taping my conversations? Too, <laughs> you probably could. Ironically, tape my I am taping your conversations. You are taping, right yeah, now. but not my cell phone. This is uh, that maybe it's too soon for that kind of a joke. Too right, soon. That's, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We are. Uh, we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk about decision making. Yes. Uh, today, yes, we're going to talk about making tough decisions. This time, uh, at the uh, at the at the senior leadership level, we're going to talk about yeah. boards and presidents and making decisions that that might turn your stomach. Boy, this is a loaded one, right? Right. I mean, I mean, part of what's loaded about this is that the more I'm doing this, and I don't know if it's just because obviously the more you do anything, the more you have insight into what what's really going on, or there's just the nature of things are are becoming even more uncertain is that there's a, there's a real lack of uh, understanding. And I actually think, it, it, and if we're honest, there isn't an answer to the problems that we're having. Meaning, I, I think that we somehow think, you know, and I'll use myself, you know, we'll get hired to, to develop a peer analysis, right, of an institution compared to its schools and ratios and all this interesting data, and then we'll hand over the report, and somehow magically that report is going to translate into something for the institution that they can. Now, now the big picture is these reports become evidence or, or, or it, it allowed the senior leaders to say, not just look what this consultant said, uh, although sometimes you, you hire the really well-known consultants because you can then say you can hide behind their findings, right? Mm-hmm. Because look, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're, we're going to let go of a uh, quarter of our workforce because consultants did this and blah, blah, blah. But that's not really what we do. But when we design a report that uncovers uh, the difference between where your institution is and where another institution. So let's say the question is, what, let's say that the findings show that your peer institutions have uh, a seven to one ratio uh, between uh, administrators and faculty, right? And your ratio is four to one. Okay. Okay. Now, the reason this is interesting and important to administrators or leaders, they go, you know, we want to use that to, to justify if we're going to make some administrative changes, if we're going to change the ratio so that we're going to have fewer people taking care of more people. And that's going to help us with cost because the biggest cost in higher ed is the people side. But think about the process of navigating that insight, those facts, uh, back to actually making the decision. Right. So obviously we can make tough decisions. If you have an employee and they're not working out and you've really given them the opportunity to step up and they still haven't stepped up, uh, the tough decision might be to say, we're making a change. Uh, And I can tell you that when I'm sitting down with leaders who are looking to make tough decisions about moving associate vice presidents up or down or out, uh, the challenge they have is uh, I'll often find myself six months later talking to them and they say, you know, I finally made that decision. And they'll say to me, I should have done this when I knew what the answer was. But they don't. And maybe it's human nature. What, yeah, what is it that makes them stall? Uh, lots of different reasons. I, I think it is a, a – well, I'll tell you what they do to – to, to not make the decision is they internally justify why maybe they shouldn't make the decision. You know, so for example, if you know it's the right thing to do to move somebody into a different role or out, the justification is I haven't given them enough time. Or maybe, or, or you know, this person's so well liked here. I mean, these are all valid, right? There's a loyalty factor that plays in, uh, which I think is actually very admirable. But what's interesting about loyalty is you think about when they bring in a new person from the outside. The reason those people can make tough decisions is because they don't have the loyalty 
Uh, and, and if they're good, what they're focusing in on is uh, the nature of the problem, and they're looking at it in a dispassionate way. They're not looking at it that, you know, this particular person has been here for 25 years and everybody loves this person. What's interesting is, is that I think tough decisions like this have to be looked at, have to be made, and people have to be willing to actually produce a level of discomfort in their organization, uh, but do it in a compassionate way. There are ways of of helping people make a transition out of the organization that is compassionate, that helps them. And I can tell you, nine times out of ten, the people who are potentially in that position are not happy in their work anyways. They know they're not they're not in the right job. That's part of the reason why it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what, what I'm speaking to here, because when I think about the overarching question, making tough decisions, it often has to do with people decisions. You know, we're on a number of projects right now that we are dancing around every possible way to make changes so that it doesn't affect people, so that we don't have to talk about the people. And everybody in the room knows that the conversation that's going to really help make us more effective and efficient is looking at people. But we don't want to talk about it. It's fascinating. But well, and so it begs the question: Is that some sort of a, is that is that an unstated uh, sort of a cultural moray that we don't talk about people, or is it is it come at some level of directive? That you know what it is. Political, it's the difference. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, you know what it is. I actually think that we have a premise in higher education or a, a philosophy that doesn't exist in the corporate world, right? If 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 you are not performing in an organization that is based on profit, you are out of there. It's, it's, it's very clear. Higher ed traditionally uh, is not performance focused. Now what's fascinating is the longer I do this work is nine times out of 10, every or actually maybe 10 times out of 10, every school that I've worked with has an incredible uh, at least in their region, great reputation. But every school I've worked with that you go under the covers and you look and see how they get their work done, it's dysfunctional. <laughs> not, not one. I don't, yeah. care, I don't care what organization, if you're the elite institutions or you're a small community college, it is just the nature of pulling people together to try and get work done. In an environment where uh, conflict is something that you avoid. Higher ed is a very polite environment, right? And everyone has to be involved in the decision, right? Consensus in higher ed means we, everybody has to agree we're going to do this. Otherwise, we're not going to decide. All of this is being challenged today if anything's going to change. I, would, I, I want to highlight what you just said. All of us have to – consensus in higher ed is – all of us have to do, <laughs> agree on a direction, otherwise we're not going to decide, as opposed to otherwise we're not going to do it. Right. Right. Those are two different, very different things. It's not semantics, right? We, we're going to leave open decisions that will become <laughs> poison to the organization rather than close the decision, which may mean we're ineffective, right? Ultimately, we're not getting new things done, but we're not leaving anything hanging. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I and I know that you and I are making gross generalizations yes. because every, we could every institution, anyone listening to this knows of examples of where that's not happening, where it is effective in their organization. But I think if you step back and you sort of look at it from 30,000 feet, mm -hmm. this is the chronic dilemma in higher education is there's a there is a you talk about transition. We're in a transition where they're being asked to look at themselves uh, more from a bottom line perspective, right? And at the same time, they don't want to see themselves in that way. And they have to speak the language of the academics, which is this is not about making profit. This is about the, uh, this is about education. This is about this is about something much bigger 
than uh, our ability to be sustainable. At the same time, faculty absolutely understand that financial sustainability is important, but it's not their primary concern. I was with a I was with a um, a board member who was a faculty member at a different school, and she was like, you know what? If we go in this new direction, I'm just going to leave. <laughs> if we're gonna if we're gonna integrate if we're gonna integrate uh, online learning in the way that I think we're talking about doing, uh, I'm just going to leave. And 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 the nature of the way that she engages in the conversation is to point out all the reasons why. Uh, we shouldn't be going in this direction. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a bit like um, I'm taking my toys with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, count, so, get, let me count the metaphors. Fall on my sword, yeah. take my ball now, and going now, home. Now, now let me tell can. you, I know that I have a bias, uh, which I have to be careful of, because most of my work over the last 28 years has been around the administrative side the operational side of college and universities. Uh, and the bias is because I've been around that perspective, I, I have to work harder to recognize what they're doing that's causing the problem too. And I can tell you, I know financial leaders or leaders on the administrative side who recognize, and, and I see this too, that they have to look at themselves and say, do we have – too big an administrative workforce to be able to get this work done. And actually, I think for the most part, that's true. We have too many layers on the administrative side in higher education to get the work done. If you if you were building a, a, a university from scratch, if you were saying, all right, we're going to build it, how would we structure ourselves? You would not need the layers that you have. And faculty know this, uh, but asking people who are responsible for the administration and actually control the money, what gets spent, asking them to look at themselves is a really hard thing to do. That's a dilemma. Right, right. Right? You have to, be, on some level, there has to be a level of selflessness in this kind of work. It's almost like you're going to be willing to say, and I'm willing to step back. You know, I had a school recently where they made a decision that they were going to. You know, there was a perk where senior leadership got a got a car, right? And this is not atypical, where you get, you know, and, and the and the university provides a car if you're at a certain level, mm-hmm. uh, and you use it for work and all that. They they removed that benefit, and it affected the person. But he said, you know what? If we don't dem- if we don't demonstrate that we're willing to make some sacrifices, how can we ask other people to make sacrifices? And that that to me. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a small example, but it's an example I think we all have to be thinking about is what does shared sacrifice mean, right? And I think if you don't, if you don't demonstrate that, you're going to have a harder time making tough decisions because people are going to go, you know, it's easy for you to say, cut this academic program. What are you doing to, to solve this problem? Right, right. Well, that's the that's the the premise of negotiation. I mean, it's just being able to come to to the table and talk about these things. But you brought up this idea of selflessness, and I I think there's another side to that, which is you know uh, maybe another way to frame self. Lessness is extreme selfishness. That I am highest, produ- uh, you know, I'm a, a, a at my highest performance when my self interest is in core alignment with the organizational interest, uh, and. Yeah, uh, you know when you when you look at this board member who you know as we sort of joke you know I'm going to take my my ball and go home. Well, the the other way I look at that is to say you know my self interest is no longer in alignment with the organizational interests anymore, and so I'm this is a demonstration well, of character. Well, here's what's different. So. What's difficult about this is the organizational focus is shifting, and there's power and politics yeah. that goes into what does it mean we want to be, right? Yeah. So 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 one core question is, and it's a, it's a it's a valid question. Uh, which is, do we want to expand uh, the way we think about delivering what we do beyond the traditional way we've been doing it for hundreds of years? And for some disciplines, and, and I agree with this, like liberal arts disciplines, those are harder ones to consider making an online experience because the discourse face-to-face 
is is a powerful discourse. Well, and I think that's a that's a that's a uh, I think what you just sort of demonstrated is the is the administrative perspective of these decisions, right? Which is, do we want to do online, right? Rather than the faculty perspective was, which would be, is online a good alternative for this discipline? Exactly. And and I think and, that's that's part of a problem because online is a great great beautiful panacea of uh, of of you know financial wonder uh from an administrative side for a lot right. of institutions right it is right, absolutely right. the right way to go if you just want you know numbers we'll figure right. out a way to put numbers on the books online right right so everyone's got to slow down right and because what happens is they don't have that kind of targeted conversation they they end up debating all or nothing yeah. as opposed to debating uh where could this be appropriate where is it not appropriate it's a, these are great questions to have right. but instead i think we don't go into these conversations framing the right questions i mean I, if there's anything i think that is a critical thing for leaders to be doing more and more effectively is figuring out what are the right questions to frame uh, not this is what I want to do mm -hmm. but if I'm going to try and get a good answer ar around a problem I need to be willing to frame great questions be willing to listen to different points of view and be open to alternatives and that's that takes patience and, and part of right now What's difficult is that there's a, on some level, a lack of patience for really trying to uncover what the real problems are. It's more like we got to solve this stuff. We have a we have an operating budget gap of X, Y, or Z. How are we going to? Oh, I know what we'll do. We'll we'll take two percent of the budget mm -hmm. out of each department. That solves it, right? And it's no longer sufficient. And 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 the truth is, leaders know this. Leaders know that that's so not strategic to just keep asking people to cut their budgets. You know, and and that's what we're in the middle of. Well, it's the last thing you recommend is is a straight line budget, less a percentage. Well, why do you right? do it? <laughs> Obviously, it's it's so fascinating. It's like because I I always asking the question of motivation. The motivation is, it's fair. Nobody can play can complain that the that the department to their left didn't have to go through the same thing. You know, this is where leadership comes in. It's like no one, no, they shouldn't be cutting their budget. That's where we're growing. You should be cutting your budget because we are not going to be growing in this area. Those are tough decisions. And you need strong leaders willing to have those kinds of conversations and, in a sense, putting their jobs at risk. You know, I heard a statistic that in the last year, last two years, there have been the greatest number of, I don't have the percentage, but the greatest number of, of, um, uh, no confidence vote of presidents. I think that's a good sign. What that means is they're pushing on. They're pushing on the envelope. They're they're pushing on change. When I say a good sign, I don't mean it economically. I don't mean it's good. But the reality is, in these times, if we're not pushing for change and getting people uh, to question, we're at risk of sort of living in like. Uh, la la land, thinking that somehow this is going to fix itself. We got to put some tough things on the table and and have these tough conversations. Some schools are doing a phenomenal job at this, and others are trying to figure out where to get into this. Some of them, many of them, are trying to avoid the people conversation, mm -hmm. and there's still this attitude: let's get through this. Um, so it's a, it's it's. There is no one size fits all answer, and that's what's so fascinating about it. It would be so much nicer if I could create a, you know, a formula that yeah. all schools could. But it's that's not. And not only that, Pete, it's it's the fact that if you look at the different types of institutions, from small community colleges to private institutions to the publics to the research, uh, each one of them have sort of different thematic issues. So the you know there's all this stuff out there about um, there's all this stuff out there about here's what how higher ed should change online. You cannot apply those ideas the same to a community college, 
as you would to a private elite institution. They're two different. They're they're they're, they're two different audiences, two different financial models. So we have to we have to be thinking more discreetly about the audience or the the institution type that we're working with. Mm-hmm. You, you know, there's, there's so many great connections between what we were talking about this week and what we talked about last week. This idea of of dealing with this as a segmentation approach, living in what we living with our our data today, with what we have now, and making decisions based on who we are, uh, and not who the industry says we should be. Again and again, I think what we've done is we have effectively not solved the problem. One of these, one of these podcasts, we're going to have this epiphany, and it's all going to become clear. And then That's I'm right. not sure what's going to happen, but, but I think that we are we are really developing an incredible competency to put more problems on the table that are only going to make people <laughs> anxious. That's going to cause them to stop listening. Not at all, because you never know. Week. Next week could be the one. This is okay. the, this is the cliff. Every week's a cliffhanger. The, the, the eternal optimist. Until okay. we Wait. solve all of higher ed's uh, uh, woes. <laughs> Not going to happen, but <laughs> we can keep trying. We will keep trying. Uh, we will keep trying next week. Uh, until then, please check us out on the blog at typelink.com. You can find uh, all of our past episodes and, and uh, jump over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. That's the easiest way to make sure you don't miss a single episode. And you know, if you like what we're doing here, we sure appreciate your comments over on iTunes, and it's a great way. Your comments and ratings uh, are a great way to help other people discover uh, this show when they are searching around uh, topics around higher ed. So we thanks for thank you for your attention to that as well. Uh, and I think that's it. On behalf of that's Howard it. Teibel, I'm Pete Wright. We will catch you next week on Navigating Change, a podcast from Teibel, Inc. Mm-hmm.